welcome to EPG Pathshala. Uh, I'm Anju Narayan, uh, retired associate professor from Delhi University. Today we'll uh, take up the modules on new criticism to archetypal criticism. Now the objectives being to trace the developments uh, in new criticism up to archetypal criticism, to learn their basic assumptions and key concepts, and to understand the position of new and myth critics and their contribution. Now, talking about uh, the origin of new criticism, it's rather complex and apparently contradictory, especially in its theoretical and critical positions and practices. It is in sharp reaction to sociological or Marxian criticism, which regarded literature as a product of society. It stressed on textual criticism, it is just like establishing a new professional criticism. The influence of Matthew Arnold's concept of poetry and culture is clearly perceptible in them. The new critics were also influenced by modernist poets and critics like uh, T. E. Hume and T. S. Eliot, whose poetry and criticism emphasized the importance of the internal dynamics of the poetic form. All the foundations of the new criticism, at the foundations of the new criticism, was the idea of the critic as a kind of technician whose specialized knowledge and skills enabled a form of close reading of literary texts that found meaning and value in form. Now, the new criticism flourished from the 20s to the 50s and was primarily concerned with poetry and poetic form. Though one can trace its origin, Back to a lecture, the new criticism delivered by Elias Pingham in 1920, the term new criticism is, like, is used to refer to the theory and practice that was prominent in the American literary criticism until late 1960. The term is coined after, the, after John Crow Ransom's most influential work, The New Criticism, in 1941. It's less a coherent uh, literary theory than the critical and theoretical approaches, all of which are grounded on the idea that the literary work is autonomous and its unity and meaning are constituted primarily by formal and rhetorical features that take precedence over social, political and biographical contexts. What are his basic assumptions and practices? Let us look at those. Unlike historical criticism or biographical criticism, new criticism completely concerns with the text itself, with its language and organization, with ontological discussion. It warns the reader against the critical practices which divert attention from the text itself. The distinctive practice of new critics is close reading, a detailed and subtle analysis of complex interrelations and ambiguities of the inherent elements of the literary work. It studies how the parts of the text relate with each other, how it contains the resolves, irony, paradox, paradox, tension and ambiguities. Their emphasis is on the organic unity of overall structure and verbal meaning. They conceive literary work as being a literary construct. They think about figures of speech, symbols, imagery, meaning within text. For them, the essential components of a literary work are symbols, images, words, rather than plot, character, theme, and thought. They try to displace content of literary analysis and treat the work's form and its content. Form was treated as self-contained and autonomous entity, deserving all critical attention. For them, the literary art is a complete entity in itself. And the function of the critic is to analyze, interpret, and evaluate the work of art. And his function should be unbiased and focus only on the text itself. The study of words, their arrangements, the way in which they act and react on each other is all important. Words, besides their literary meaning and significance, also have emotional, associative, symbolic significance. And only close reading and analysis can bring out their total meaning. Unlike the reader response theory, the merit of the work is to be found in its language and its structure. They view literary work as a self-sufficient, autonomous object whose failure and success, charms or lack of it, 
are to be found in the work itself. The merit of the work lies neither in the minds of the writer nor in the response of the reader, but in the language and the structure of the work itself. The text, the text is more important than the reader and the writer. Let us look at the similarities and differences uh, between new criticism and formalism. Both stress that literary work is a self-sufficient verbal entity, a world within itself. Both, secondly, both stress on the analysis of the literary work. Thirdly, both consider poetry as a special mode of language. And uh, coming to the difference between the two, the formalists emphasize that the literary te text is made up of linguistic and literary devices to achieve special effect of uh, foregrounding and defamiliarization. They stress on the literariness of a work on the other hand, new criticism emphasizes on the complex interplay within a text. For them, text is made up of irony, paradox, tension, and metaphorical meaning. The emphasis is on the organic unity of structure and verbal meaning. I'd like to move on to a brief introduction to John Crow Ransom, who is supposed to be the most influential new critic. Uh, he was born on April 30th, 1888, and he died uh, on July 3rd, 1974. He was an American educator, scholarly, scholar, literary critic, poet, an essayist, and an editor. Now, he is considered to be uh, the founder of this new criticism school of literary criticism. He is also the founder of Kenyan Review and author of several literary and critical, critical works, including the World's Body, published in 1938, and The New Criticism, published in 1941. In his seminal uh, essay written in 1937, titled Criticism Incorporated, Ransom laid out his ideal form of literary criticism, stating that criticism must become more scientific or precise and systematic. He rejected the romanticist commitment to self-expression and perfectibility as well as the naturalist insistence on fact, uh, which was mostly scientific facts, and inference from fact as the basis of evaluating a work of art. Instead, he focused his attention on the work of art as an object in and of itself, independent of outside influences. At the end, he argued that personal responses to literature, historical scholarship, linguistic scholarship, and uh, what he termed uh, moral studies should not influence literary criticism. Now we'll take a look at John Ransom's uh, Criticism Incorporated, a brief reference to that. His essay appeared in the Virginia Quarterly Review in 1937. Here he gave a definite trademark to criticism. He pondered over the would-be critic or who can criticize more genuinely and dispassionately. He considers that a poet or an artist himself, a philosopher and a professor, could, could criticize poetry. But the criticism of the poet or the artist himself may be profoundly dominated by personal estimation, personal fallacies, and they are better critics of their own art than are other artists. Ransom asserts, I quote, criticism must become more scientific or precise and systematic. And this means that it must be developed by the collective and sustained effort of learned persons, unquote. He believes that criticism incorporated or criticism limited is the business of professionals, professors of literature in particular. The professors of English should not divert themselves into humanistic or leftist advocacy of a model system because their main concern is literature as an art and its structure. Now, we look at uh, the various ways that academics uh, try to escape from their true criticism, as suggested by John Crow in his uh, writing titled Criticism Incorporated. Ransom predicates various ways that academics take to escape from their true criticism. How? There's a personal judgment 
recording to subjective response or effect of a work or there is synopsis and paraphrase or there are historical linguistic moral studies and any other that concerns with abstract philosophy. And in the case of poetry, one should concentrate on those devices that distinguish it from prose. He asserts that critics should be able to exhibit not the prose core, but the differentia, residue or tissue which keeps the object poetical. For the good critic, the character of a poem lies in its way of exhibiting residuary quality. Later, he distinguishes between texture and structure. Now, we look at structure and texture separately. The structure is the story, object, a situation or whatever that gives the poem its argument. The structure is referred to the argument or concept within the work. It is a trial design or organization of a particular poem, the form to which all parts contribute. It is more comprehensive and includes the argument or the development of the theme in a poem. The texture is the thingness of thing. It comprises the particular details and devices of a work. For example, the consistency of imagery help to create texture of a poem in metaphysical school of poetry. The texture stands for the basic metrical patterns for relation of sounds, images, phrases with each other in a poem. Now, uh, we'll take a quick look at the difference between John Crow Ransom and other new critics. Ransom, on the one hand, Ransom argues that the interplay of determinate and indeterminate meaning and the relation of structure and texture are important for the critic. Here he differs from other new critics. What is structure to other new critics is texture to Ransom. He believes that a critic must first study the structural properties of a poem and then moves to an approach to an appreciation and judgment of its texture. He also argued that literary critics should regard a poem as an aesthetic object. Now we move on to the limitations of new criticism. The limitations of new criticism were pinpointed by Chicago critics, especially by R.S. Crane in his book titled Critics and Criticism, published in 1952. Now, they, uh, according to him, the new critics are too much preoccupied with textual analysis, words, irony, paradox, images, and they forget that the poem is an organic whole. Their approach is dogmatic, narrow, and ignores the claim of historical, sociological, psychological, and biological analysis. Each of these has its own significance. Any art has two functions, aesthetic, and moral. Now, while the older criticism erred with overemphasis on moral function of literature, new criticism errs in its overemphasis on aesthetic function. It ignores the reactions of critics and responses of readers. It also ignores the study of history of literary criticism, which trains a critic to find out literary merits and its values. The textual analysis can establish only the literary quality of a work. We need other critical methods to determine its greatness. All kinds of literature cannot be judged by textual approach. Though it may be effective for some genres, all genres cannot be evaluated by it. Now we look at the origin and development of uh, archetypal criticism. While the origin of new criticism is complex and apparently contradictory, the origin of archetypal criticism is more definite. The term archetype is derived from the Greek word archetopos, which means first impression. In literary criticism, the term archetype denotes recurrent narrative designs, patterns of action, character types, themes and images which are identifiable in a wide variety of works of literature as well as myths, dreams and social rituals. 
Such recurrent archetypes are held to be the result of elemental and universal forms in human psyche. Archetypal criticism owes its origin to James G. Fraser's uh, work titled The Golden Bow and uh, the psychological theories of C. G. Hume who ap applied the term to what he called primordial images, the psychic residue. The main source of archetypal criticism is myth and its study, therefore it's also called as myth criticism. Archetypal literary criticism is concerned with analyzing a text to the myths and the archetypes that could be in the text in the form of description, symbols, images, allusions, references, char characteristic traits, etc. Now let us look at the difference between a myth, legend and folklore. To start with, a myth is a story in mythology, a system of hereditary stories of ancient origin which were once believed uh, to be true and which were served to explain why the world is as it is and why the thing happen, things happen as they do. Myth provides a rationale for social customs and observances and establishes the sanction rules by which people conduct their lives. In, if the protagonist is a human being, the traditional story is called a legend. If the story concerns with supernatural beings but not God and the story is not a part of systematic mythology, it is called a folklore. For example, the stories of Ram and Krishna are myth while the stories of Akbar and Birbal are legend. And the stories of Vikram and Betal or Sihasan Batisi, they are folklore. Now, what are the basic presumptions regarding the three that we have just defined? Myth critic believes that just as dreams reflect the unconscious desires and anxieties of an individual, myths are symbolic projection of people's hopes, values, fears, and aspirations. The critic works inductively by reading individual works and letting critical principles shape them out of the literature that it is. The critic examines the individual work to ascertain the archetypes underlying the work. He tries to discover how literary work transform reality to which readers give perennial response. The myth critic is concerned to seek out those mysterious elements that inform certain literary works and that elicit with almost uncanny force, dramatic and universal human reactions. Just as psychological analysis of a literary work tends to be experimental and diagnostic, it is closely related to biological science. Myth criticism tends to be speculative and philosophical. Its affinities are with religion, anthropology, and cultural history. Unlike Freudian critic, the myth critic sees a work as the manifestation of symbols and images arising from collective unconsciousness. The myth critic tries to reveal the mind and character of a people by studying myths. And just as dreams reflect the unconscious desires and anxieties of the individual, so myths are the symbolic projections of a people's hopes, values, fears and aspirations. Unlike uh, the traditional critic, the myth critic is more interested in prehistory and biographies of gods. Unlike formalist, the myth critic probes for inner spirit which gives the work its vitality and its enduring appeal. Now we'll move on to archetypal criticism and Maud Botkin. Archetypal criticism was first experimented by Maud Botkin in her book Archetypal Patterns in Poetry, published in 1934. She explores and explains the feeling and associations evoked by certain passages of poetry. She focuses on Coleridge's Ancient Mariner, Shakespeare's Hamlet and Othello, Shakespeare's Hamlet and Othello, and Milton's Paradise Lost. She demonstrated that how the primordial images recur in poetry and how they appeal through their expressions, through their expression of inner life. Then uh, now uh, we move on to archetypal, archetypal criticism and Northrop Fry. 
the archetypal criticism became popular in the 1940s and 1950s, largely due to the work of Canadian critic, literary critic Northrop Fry. Now, is a liter uh, Northrop Fry theorized archetypal criticism in the true sense. His major work is Anatomy of Criticism, published in 1957, then uh, The Archetypes of Literature and Fearful Symmetry, published in 1947. He gives a new definition of nature to literature and criticism. He argues that one cannot learn literature, but what one learns is the criticism of literature. For Fry, criticism has every feature of science. Criticism should be a systematic, scientific and organic study. Criticism as a science is totally intelligible and literature as a subject of science is a source of new critical discoveries. Fry is of the opinion that every poet has his own mythology, particular formation of images and symbols of which he is unconscious. But what will happen when the multiple poets use the same images and symbols in literature? Therefore, he searches for archetypal patterns in literature. For him, the key lies in the recognition of archetypes which constitute a unifying category of criticism. Myth is an archetype and central in literature. In the cycle of the day, of year and of human life, there is a pattern of significance out of which myth can be constructed. Next, we shall take a look at North of Fry's concept of theory of mythoi. He proceeds from a theory of archetypal meaning to the theory of mythoi. His theory of archetypal meaning includes apocalyptic, demonic, and analogical imagery. The theory of mythoi includes the mythoi of spring, which implies comedy, summer, which could mean romance, autumn, which could imply tragedy, and winter, irony and satire. The archetypal theme of comedy is recognition of romance, is conflict of tragedy, is catastrophe, and of irony and satire as frustration and confusion of heroism and effective action. Besides it, he analyzes the archetype of quest myth, the relation of archetypal criticism to religion and God as human character. He also analyzes the archetype of water, sun, pastoral images, forest or Arcadian and geometrical images, mineral world and archetypes of good mother, holy mother and terrible mother. At last, he advocates that literature cannot be examined in isolation. It should be read in totality, from primitive to the sophisticated, and the search for archetype is a kind of literary anthropology. Now we'll take a look at his uh, theory, another theory of Northrop Fry, titled Fearful Symmetry. In Fearful Symmetry, Fry showed that Blake deliberately used a regular pattern of symbolism which reflected Milton and ultimately on the Bible. Fry also advocates a difference in the way a symbol is interpreted in connection with different genres. He identifies five different spheres, namely human, animal, vegetation, mineral, and water. While uh, humans in co comedic work for fulfillment of wishes, in tragic, it acts in a tyrannical way, leading to isolation and downfall. Animals are gentle and pastoral in comedic, while predatory in tragic. Vegetation is represented by the formations like gardens, parks, and flowers in case of comic. In case of tragic, it is present in the form of wild forest or barren land. Cities, temples, precious stones, etc. represent the mineral sphere in uh, comedic, while deserts, ruins, and the likes in the tragic. Now, while the sphere of water is present in the form of rivers in comedic, it appears as floods and seeds, etc., in the tragic. So, the same spheres are to be interpreted in different ways and to different effects in the case of the comedic and the tragic works, respectively. In his writing, uh, title Literature as Context, Milton's Lycidas. Fry demonstrates how the subject of an elegy is not treated as an individual but as a representative of a dying spirit of nature. The pastoral name Lycidas is equivalent to Adonis 
and Milton uses the imagery of the cycle of sun, of season and of water. Now, uh, we'll take up other prominent myth critics. We'll move on to other prominent myth critics. Other prominent myth critics are G. Wilson Knight, Robert Graves, Philip Wheelwright, Richard Chase, Leslie Fielder, Joseph Campbell, C. H. Hume, and Annis Pratts. They emphasize the occurrence of mythical patterns in literature. They have analyzed the archetypes of birth, death, rebirth theme, the underground journey, the heavenly ascent, the search for father, the paradise, hell images, the Promethean rebel hero, the scapegoat and earth goddesses, and the fatal woman. Despite now, now we'll take a look at the limitations of myth criticism. Now, despite the special importance of the myth critics' contribution, myth criticism is, for several reasons, poorly understood due to the lack of proper interpretive tools which become available through the development of various disciplines as anthropology, psychology, and cultural history in recent age. Secondly, many scholars and teachers of literature have remained skeptical of myth criticism because of its tendencies towards the cultic and the occult. Myth critics, they tend to forget that literature is more than a vehicle for archetypes and ritual patterns. In other words, they run the risk of being distracted from the aesthetic experience of the work itself. They forget that literature is above all else art. Finally, there has been a discouraging confusion over concepts and definitions among the myth initiates themselves, which has caused many would-be myth critics to turn their energies to more clearly defined approaches, such as the traditional or formalist. So I hope uh, I have been, uh, been able to give you a fairly good insight into these modules on new criticism to archetypal criticism. We have covered a large area, beginning from the origins of uh, archetypal criticism to uh, new criticism, uh, incorporating the initiators of new criticism, and also uh, the myth critics. And if, uh, you and if you require any more information on the same, you can refer to the EPG uh, website. The e-texts are available on that website. Thank you.